the second part of our um, nutrition webinars looking at the eventing horse. Um, David did a fab fabulous presentation last week looking at um, fitness training using a mobile phone app and heart rate monitor and how to estimate workload and, um, and exercise um, using, using those um, technologies. And so I'm following on today, looking at nutrition of the performance horse or the eventing horse, but a lot of these principles can be used um, across the board for multiple disciplines. So don't be um, disheartened if you're a, a rainer, for example, and these, these principles do apply. Um, next week, we're going to have an amazing um, talk as well with a panel of professional eventers ready to answer questions and talk about how they do it out in the field. So stay tuned for information about that. So when we're talking about eventing horses, um, we're talking about, I believe, the ultimate performance horse. These horses are serious athletes. Um, they need to display multiple skills to perform at what is essentially a triathlon in the horse world. They need to show trainability, um, rhythm, smoothness, soundness, suppleness, et cetera, and um, complete obedience in that dressage phase, which I know can be quite tricky on a finely tuned, extremely fit and well-fed um, cross-country machine. The next day, obviously, on cross-country day, they need to show um, endurance and strength and stamina, um, and coupled with their rider, a little bit of insanity, possibly. <laughs> um, and then, of course, the horse needs to recover um, to perform in the show jumping phase, which can be very technical, but also involve a fair bit of speed. Um, so there's a lot of um, considerations to, to um, take into account when you're looking at nutrition for these horses. Traditionally, horses were fed in a very simple way. It was forage and oats, essentially, but there's been some major advances in equine nutrition over the years. We have um, an improved knowledge of how um, the horse works, of their energy demands and their metabolism for, for burning energy. Um, we're able to estimate workload and energy requirements a lot more easily now. Um, and coupled with advances in equine nutrition, um, such as um, improvements in understanding different ingredients, as well as processing techniques, there's an awful lot of information out there and there's an awful lot of ways we can feed our horses to get the results that we want. When we're talking about performance horses and eventing horses in particular, energy is the major factor that we, that we need to consider when we're designing these diets. Um, when I talk about energy, I'm talking about the fuel that's used for muscle contraction. So the units of energy, we talk about calories or joules or megajoules, depending on what country you're in. We're not necessarily talking about the spark or the, the hyperactivity that the horse has, although that term is used um, for energy as well. But I'm talking specifically about the fuel. We know that we're feeding the right amount of energy when the horse maintains its body condition at the workload that we're asking for it. Um, so it's really important for all horse owners, regardless of whether you have a fat pony in the paddock to an elite three-day eventer, to know how to monitor your body condition, looking at fat coverage of various parts of the body. Know when that changes, look at your horse, feel your horse. Um, and also, if you can, um, regularly weigh your horse, either with scales, ideally, or with a weight tape to see if the horse's weight changes. And that's how you know you're feeding the right amount of energy. The horse has one fuel that it uses for muscle contraction, and that's called um, adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, which you might have heard about. They um, produce this fuel in their muscle cells. Um, however, there's various substrates that they use to, to store glycogen in the muscle to burn to create ATP. Um, and so horses will do this by fermentation of fibre in the gut. They'll do this through um, the breakdown of starch and sugar into glucose, which is then stored as glycogen. Um, and they'll also do this by breaking down fat into triglycerides, which head into a specific cycle within the cell to produce ATP. The important part of that, obviously, that's a lot of, there's a lot of biochemistry in that, and it's probably a talk in itself. But what it's important to note is that there's two major reactions that a horse's muscle will use to create these ATP molecules. Number one on this particular image is in the green section, which is oxidative phosphorylation or the, the breakdown of substrates to produce ADP using oxygen. So um, this is breaking down carbohydrates, fats, and amino acids um, into energy. Um, and this uses oxygen, so it's considered aerobic. The other way that the horse's muscle will, will 
um, produce ATP is um, generally utilized in the, in the flight response or during very rapid exertion. And this is called anaerobic glycolysis or the breakdown of glycogen without oxygen or anaerobically to produce ATP. Now, it's interesting looking at those two pathways because when glycogen is metabolized aerobically, um, lots of ATP are produced, 36 ATP are produced. But when glycogen is metabolized anaerobically or rapidly, only three or two or three ATPs are produced and a lot, a lot of lactic acid is produced. So um, this will explain that horses um, who are working aerobically or using oxygen can, can compete for longer or work for longer periods of time um, at a slow, steady pace without becoming fatigued. But those that are doing bursts of energy and, and high speeds fatigue more rapidly. When we're talking about how the horse um, generates its ATP, there's multiple muscle types within the horse, and these have got different twitch um, frequencies. So the horse has three basic muscle types, or muscle fibres, type 1 and type 2, which is divided into 2A and 2B. Essentially, type 1 fibres are slower contracting, which are used during the slower speeds. Type 2 are faster contracting. So type 1 and type 2A fibres have quite a high oxidative capacity, which means they have oxygen available to them to generate ATP. And so they, they utilize these fuels aerobically. Um, when we get up to higher speeds, type 2B muscle fibers are um, engaged and they have a low aerobic capacity. Therefore, they create ATP anaerobically and as a result, then also generate lactic acid. Um, it's a good way to look at it when we're talking about um, the different gates. So the amount of muscle that an ATP um, will use and create um, depends on how fast it's contracting. So um, while walking, muscles obviously contract very slowly. They don't expend terribly much energy. Um, and so during this type of exercise, generally the horse is using type 1 muscle fibres. Um, the energy generation is entirely aerobic, so oxygen is used. Um, and at this speed... Um, the muscle will burn predominantly fat. And so fat stores are plentiful in, in all horses usually, and they can be mobilized um, and metabolized. Although it's slow, they can do it fast enough to regenerate ATP used when they're walking. However, as speed increases, other muscle types are needed to be um, engaged. And so as speed increases to a trot and a canter, the type 1 fibers aren't capable of contracting as rapidly to propel the horse. And so we use we start using type 2A fibres. And so these use a combination of glycogen and fat for energy generation. Um, glycogen can still be metabolised aerobically in these type 2A fibres, and it's twice as fast as fat for ATP generation, so it can fuel faster speeds. However, as the horse moves into a gallop, um, type 2B fibres are required, and these are... Um, anaerobic, these um, use anaerobic glycolysis to generate ATP. Um, obviously with anaerobic glycolysis, there's fewer ATP um, molecules produced, but it's very, very rapid. So it does fuel those, those faster contracting muscles. Um, however, lactic acid does build up and the horse fatigues quite rapidly if it isn't allowed time to, um, to rest. Kentucky Equine Research has done a lot of research looking at um, uh, performance horse energy consumption and also um, estimating energy. However, recently we've developed a smartphone application which is used with or without a heart rate monitor. And some recent work we've done looked at estimating the digestible energy requirements of three-day event horses using this software and heart rate monitor. Um, it was done using 26 eventing horses at various levels in the States. Um, using this application, um, we are able to measure heart rate, session duration, or the length of time the horse is working, the distance that it's travelled, the speed that it's travelled, um, also the altitude. So many um, pieces of information can be gleaned from this um, particular app, um, and you get a, an amazing printout at the end of your workload. So what we utilised in this particular study was the distance that the horses were trained at, the speed that they went, the gates that they used, and also the heart rate time zone. So the amount of time they spent in each um, heart rate time zone. It's well acknowledged in the performance horse world that heart rate of a horse directly correlates to oxygen consumption. So we're able to use the heart rate data that we collected in the study 
to then calculate energy expenditure and as a result, digestible energy requirements of the horse. And so we used well-known and well-established um, formulas to calculate this and found some really interesting results. Um, as the horses increased in their competition or training level, um, we found that the distance traveled um, each week during their training period increased with the level of the horse. So for example, advanced eventers traveled over much greater kilometers in their training than horses at a lower level. Um, and what we found during these workloads that based on their heart rate data was that their DE or the digestible energy requirement directly correlated to the distance traveled. Distance traveled. And similarly to the hours of exercise that they were worked each week, horses that were um, an intermediate and advanced level um, were trained for many more hours per week than horses at novice level. And again, extrapolating the data from heart rate, we were able to um, show um, that hours of exercise per week accurately predicted the digestible energy requirement of these horses. Most of us get our information um, about what to feed our horses from the National Research Council or the NRC, which publishes recommendations for nutrients um, for all classes of horse. And, and certainly when we're talking about digestible energy, it's usually expressed as a percentage of maintenance or a horse doing nothing. So for example, a horse in light work, the NRC says, um, should be 120% of maintenance required requirements. Um, horses in um, extremely heavy work or or intense work, nearly 200% of maintenance required. So this is generally accepted. And when we look at our data based on hours of exercise per week, you can see that that slotted in pretty well with the NRC recommendations. Horses working at um, four to six hours per week were in the heavy range of um, digestible energy requirement based on NRC recommendations. But what does that mean? Because of course, that's just a percentage of maintenance how do we actually know what that actually correlates to when it comes to how much feed we need to feed our horses? So here's an example I did with some relatively crude calculations because of course every horse is different. This particular made up horse is 500 kilos with a normal metabolism. So that means he's not an easy keeper and he's not a hard keeper. So he's got a normal energy requirement. We're assuming that he's fed um, recommended levels of forage. So in this particular case, seven and a half kilos of grass hay um, with a known energy content of the hay. Um, so at maintenance, that horse um, at that weight with no work requires about 68 megajoules of energy per day. And those of you in the States who are um, working in mega cows, that they're in the brackets on that table. Um, that means that the hay at seven and a half kilos is providing about 58 megajoules and there's a deficit of about 10 megajoules. So that horse needs approximately a kilo of oats to provide the calories to meet that deficit. As you increase workload, obviously the deficit will be greater than what's provided in that base amount of hay. So once you get up to heavy and intense work to meet that deficit in energy, we're looking at four and a half to six and a half kilos of oats. Um, now, obviously, I'm not going to go and formulate a diet for an eventing horse on seven and a half kilos of hay and six and a half kilos of oats, because as we all know, there's probably an awful lot lacking in that diet, even though it provides the right amount of energy. So um, how do we fuel these event horses? Well, we know when we're looking at their heart rates while they're working, that most of their work is aerobic. They're not working at that very, very high maximal heart rate. Um, levels. We know that a lot of their work is aerobic. A lot of the times after a gallop, they've got enough time to slow down and recycle that built up lactic acid so they don't fatigue. So how do we fuel those muscles? Well, stepping back to basic horse nutrition, there's a few sources of energy that we can provide them. The sources of energy form three different categories. We've got carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, which are used to a lesser extent. When we talk about carbohydrates, there's two major classes structural and non-structural. Structural carbohydrates are your fibers. So these are provided by your roughages or forages, hay, pasture, chaff, and then super fibers like soybean hulls and sugar beet. These are fermented by microbes in the hindgut um, and they provide slow release calories for the horse to use. Non-structural carbohydrates are um, consist of the cell wall part of the plant. They um, are made up of sugars and starches. They are um, actually digested in the small intestine by enzymes. Um, they're absorbed as monosaccharides or shorter chain sugars. 
Um, and they're a really readily available energy source for the horse. And so these are found in your grains, oats and barley, as well as sugar sources such as um, molasses. Every single nutrition talk that you've probably heard um, is probably been based around the fact that forage is the most important component of any horse's diet. And I'm not going to obviously waver from that, from that topic. The horse is a hindgut fermenter. It's designed to eat a lot of forage. It's designed to eat it slowly over a long period of time. So it's really important for, for the horse's health to, to provide them with a decent amount of forage every day. And so forage is pasture, hay, chaff, et cetera. Um, it's really vital um, to base a diet around this. It's a major source of energy for a lot of horses. It provides essential nutrition. Um, it also provides um, support for the digestive tract to keep the stomach and the gut microflora healthy. Um, it also acts as a reservoir in the hindgut for electrolytes and um, water to keep the horse hydrated. So not only does it provide great nutrition, it also is very, very beneficial to keep a healthy digestive tract. Another component of these structural carbohydrates or fibre sources are superfibres. Um, products like beet pulp and, and um, soybean hulls are highly digestible fibre sources with a lot of soluble fibre in them. Essentially, these are also fermented in the hindgut slowly to release a lot of energy. In fact, it's the equivalent amount of energy as the similar weight of grain. So it's a great energy source for horses that need to gain weight or need extra energy in their diet. It's also a safe form of energy. It doesn't have a huge amount of sugar in, it, in, in, this, in this energy source. So when I say forage should form the predominant factor of an equine diet, we're talking a minimum of 1% of that horse's body weight and ideally one and a half plus percent. And this is on a dry matter basis. So we talk about hay, which is essentially mostly dry matter. Um, we're talking for a 500 kilo horse, at least five kilos of hay per day, um, ideally 7.5 kilos plus per day. But this can be made up of whatever forage is available, pasture, hay, chaff, beet pulp, et cetera. The dilemma with our performance horses is that the energy requirements of these horses is probably not going to be met by forage alone. And so traditionally we would feed grain to boost the energy um, intake of these horses. However, there are some things to consider when we're feeding grain. Grains are a fabulous source of energy. They're concentrated. You don't need to eat terribly. The horse doesn't need to eat terribly much to get a good amount of energy from them. The energy comes from non-structural carbohydrates, so starches and sugars within the grain. They're palatable. Um, however, they're not balanced to complement forage. So when we're feeding straight grains or cereal grains and forage, we do need to consider vitamin and mineral supplementation. They also need to be fed carefully. Um, so we always recommend with feeding grain, um, feed le less or under 2.5 kilos um, per meal to allow the horse optimal chance of digesting grains. And this is because horses don't digest starch terribly well. They have quite a rapidly moving digestive tract. So food is consumed and moved through the stomach and the small intestine quite quickly. Um, horses also don't produce terribly much amylase, which is an enzyme used for breakdown of starch. And so these factors combined means that if you feed large meals full of grain, a lot of that grain can end up undigested in the hindgut, causing issues with um, hindgut acidosis. Um, a lot of ways we combat this is obviously managing our feed, so not feeding more than two and a half kilos of grain, but also looking at feed that's been, had some level of processing. Knowing human nutrition, processed food gets a terribly bad rap, and I tend to agree at times when you see some of the ghastly food that's on shelves, but processed feed when it comes to horses is really, really important. Um, the, the cooking and, um, and processing of feed or starch in, in the feed is a really great way to ensure that the horse will get the most out of that feed. So when we're talking about processing, we're talking about heating, so microization, extrusion, steam flaking, um, also cracking or exposing that starch. So things like pelleting, um, forming the feed into, into nuts and cubes, et cetera. It's a great way to ensure that that horse will um, be able to get everything out of that, out of that diet. There is in some cases a legitimate concern about too much grain. These tend to be in cases of horses with diagnosed issues. Um, and certainly there's a very small population 
uh, segment of the population that does need to avoid grain. So horses that have been diagnosed with gastric ulcers probably need to be on a grain-free diet while those ulcers are healed, hind gut issues, also metabolic problems such as equine metabolic syndrome, insulin dysregulation, and laminitis need to avoid grains while those horses are, um, are getting managed for that. Also in performance horses, probably more applicable um, issues regarding muscle function or rhabdomyolysis, tying up, RER, and then um, PSSM um, 1 and 2, which is the glycogen storage issue. Um, I would love to go into a lot more detail about these, these problems, particularly tying up in PSSM, which I think is applicable to a lot of um, performance horses, warm bloods particularly, um, with PSSM. Um, however, it's a talk in itself. So please stay tuned for further webinars on these health conditions, which um, do affect our performance horses. So that being said, I've sort of given grains a bit of a bad rap, but they actually are a fabulous energy source for performance horses, but there are alternative energy sources available. Um, it's now very common practice to feed fats and oils to our performance horses. It's a very energy dense form of, of food. Um, fats and oils contain three times the amount of energy as a similar weight of grains. It's also thought to be a bit of a calm energy source, so it doesn't cause a big spike in blood sugar, which therefore means the horse may be more tractable than it's fed fat. Fat's highly digestible, it's palatable, the horse utilises it very well, um, so it's certainly a, a great energy source to include in an eventing horse's diet. Dietary fat can be provided by multiple sources, commonly obviously vegetable oils, um, canola oil, soy oil, um, and as people understand the benefits of feeding omega-3 fatty acids, there's the inclusion of um, plant-based sources such as flax and linseed, and also marine-derived fats like fish oil. Now, the major difference between the linseed and the, the fish oil is that the length of the chain, so um, plant-derived omega-3 fats such as linseed provide short-chain omega-3 fats, so they don't, don't actually work as efficiently as if you were to feed a marine-derived long-chain omega-3 fatty acid. Another form of fat that um, can be fed is stabilised rice bran. This is really handy if you don't want to have a big, messy liquid feed on your hands. Um, stabilised rice bran is, a, is a, um, either a meal or a palleted feed, which is, provides lovely fat calories for, for um, performance horses as well. Protein is, um, gets a bit of a bad rap. Protein is really important for performance horses. And a lot of people will um, define the type of feed they're feeding based on protein. So they'll say, oh, look, I feed a 13 or 14% protein feed. And someone goes, well, I feed a 20% protein balancer. And really, um, I don't necessarily think protein should be the be all and end all with how one defines a feed. However, it does sort of indicate how much of that feed should be fed. Protein is vital for all, for all horses. Um, it's made up of amino acids, which are essentially the building blocks. The horse is able to um, synthesize the non-essential amino acids in its body, but it does need it to be provided with a few amino acids, um, that are essentially, which are called essential amino acids. So lysine, methionine, threonine are the main ones that you need to take into consideration. Um, making sure that you feed quality protein, which um, contains those essential amino acids, is vital for muscle health and repair. Um, it's also used for a lot of functions in the body. So make sure that your horse is getting enough, enough protein. So traditional sport horse feeds were very, very heavy in grain and sugar. So they were quite um, grain-based molasses, sweet feedy type feeds fed with a bit of fiber. And, and as the years have gone on, we've incorporated a lot of these newer energy sources. And so there's been less of a reliance on grain for energy and the improved um, utilisation or use of fats and fibres. So you can see this energy breakdown um, has been, you know, a little bit more of the pie has been given to fibre and um, fat for energy. Um, and so the way we feed our eventers will differ depending on what country you're in and what you prefer to feed and, and what is available in your market. Um, a lot of these feeds do, choice and, choices and feeds do come down to rider and owner preference, um, but also the speed and level which the horse is being trained. Obviously, lower level eventers be high, quite happy on higher fat and fibre feeds. Um, however, um, as you move up through the grades and you're needing to have those faster speeds, some amount of carbohydrate is pretty important um, because the horse needs to utilise that glucose really quickly to 
perform at those faster speeds. Other considerations to take, in, um, to take under your belt when you're looking at feed is, of course, vitamin and mineral balance. Um, eventing horses have a greater um, requirement for vitamins and minerals than um, a lot of idle horses. Um, and if you think about it, when we're feeding a horse that's out on an improved pasture that might be one or two species, it's feeding a hay that might be one species, there's going to be some deficiencies because they're not foraging like they might have done um, where they've got access to lots of different um, plant species. So we do need to consider vitamin and mineral supplementation. So this is where your pre-mixed feeds, balances and supplements come in. So feed stores are full of pre-mixed feeds. A lot of feed companies produce a lot of pre-mixed feeds. Um, it's important to know what you're looking at when you're reading a bag tag. Um, they generally contain added protein and are fortified with vitamins and minerals, although again, make sure you read the bag. Um, fortification of how much vitamins and minerals are put into that feed will depend on what the feed's designed for. So the person that said that they were feeding a 20% protein balancer would only feed a very small amount of that per day to get their vitamins and minerals in. The other person that was on the 12% um, sweet feed is feeding more per day. So the concentration of vitamin and minerals per mouthful is less on those higher intake feeds. And there are some ingredients or nutrients that can't or that aren't put into a feed bag. So this is where your supplements come in. I walk into a lot of feed rooms and they're full to the brim of supplements. And um, half the time, a lot of people don't even know why they feed them. Um, but marketing is a fabulous thing when it comes to buying supplements. I think it's important with supplementation to um, only supplement if the diet is lacking specific nutrients or you have a specific targeted problem that you need to look at. It's important not to overdo them, not to double up. Make sure you know what you're feeding on your forage and your feed before you add the supplements. Um, it's also important to have realistic expectations as to what a supplement might do for your horse and you. Um, often there's no quick fix to um, poor performance if it comes down to a training issue or your horse just isn't um, talented enough. So please be realistic with what a, what a supplement might be able to do. However, with our high performance horses, you cannot have a diet formulated without electrolytes. So Electrolytes are minerals that dissociate into solution um, into um, electrically charged ions. <laughs> they play a really important role in maintaining the osmotic pressure in the body, fluid balance, um, nerve and muscle activity. So they're really, really vital. So when horses sweat, they use a, lose a lot of water. They also lose a lot of electrolytes that must be replenished in the diet. Um, the major um, electrolytes that we consider are sodium, potassium, chloride, and to a lesser extent, magnesium and calcium when horses are working at um, higher levels, but they must be um, replenished in the diet quite rapidly after they've been used or after they've been excreted. So to get an idea of what electrolytes you will need to feed, it's a good idea to look at the composition of horse sweat. You can see the three main electrolytes are sodium, chloride, and potassium. Um, and these are the most common electrolytes on the market will include these three ingredients, although look carefully because a lot of them will be high, very high in sugar, which isn't an ideal ingredient. Um, you'll also notice that sweat can contain a small amount of calcium and magnesium, which doesn't tend to come into account unless you're doing longer endurance type um, competitions or work. So um, usually there's enough calcium and magnesium in the diet um, without needing to supplement them with, a, with an electrolyte. However, all horses do require some amount of sodium and chloride or plain salt in their diet. Um, so we would always recommend to offer um, free choice salt to horses, either a salt lick in the paddock um, or top dress salt onto their feed to ensure that they're getting um, the right amount. When I say a plain salt block, I mean plain white sodium chloride salt lick or maybe at a push the Himalayan pink salt block, but not the mineral blocks that are red like in this picture. Um, which was the only picture I had of a horse licking something, and um, or the blue ones or the cattle ones, um, make sure it's plain salt. Again, the mineral licks may have a part to play in some aspects of horse nutrition, but not for salt intake. So make sure your horse is getting enough salt. Another important factor to notice is that we do not recommend feeding Epsom salts to horses. Um, it acts as a diuretic. It should be, can be used in a poultice on the outside of the horse, but don't feed it to your horse. 
Electrolyte loss will depend obviously on workload, but it also depends on the conditions that the horse is competing at. And this particular um, graphic here is really quite um, incredible, showing that horses worked in um, normal or, or ambient temperatures at 20 degrees Celsius, lot, but doing a 75 minute um, um, speed endurance test, um, lost about 10 kilograms of fluid, or the horses were weighed and they lost 10 kilos through after that exercise bout. When we exercise, when those horses were exercised in hot conditions at 33 to 35 degrees, which is quite common in many parts of the world, these horses lost double the amount, 20 kilos in that exercise bout. And you can see that the electrolytes that were lost during that um, exercise test, again, huge levels of, of electrolytes lost that needed to be replenished for that horse to recover. So what about all the other supplements that you see on the shelves? Well, again, this is probably a talk in itself. There's a few areas that um, you might want to target specific nutrition, um, target nutritionally, um, such as hoof or coat problems, especially horses with bad hooves may need to look at having added biotin, zinc, and thionine. Um, digestive supplements have become extremely popular in the marketplace. And again, these are, have been very beneficial for a lot of horses. Um, it contain various mixtures of pre and probiotics, buffers, toxin binders, etc. cetera. Um, we recommend that if your horse doesn't have access to fresh green pasture to supplement additional um, antioxidants, ideally natural source vitamin E, um, it's five times more bioavailable than synthetic vitamin E. So have a look at the tag on the back of your E supplementation to see that it's natural source. Um, this will help with muscle recovery and immunity. And there are heaps of supplements out there that we call nutraceutical supplements. They don't provide a nutrient that supports the horse's life, but it does provide some benefit um, to various aspects. So these are things like your joint supplements. Okay, so that was what to feed. Now, um, you're probably wanting to know how to feed or how do we recommend feeding to get the most out of your horse? One of the most common questions we get is, should I be adjusting intake for my horses um, on different days of workload? And the answer is yes and no, depending on what you're up to. Certainly for horses that are competing at lower levels where they're getting not a huge amount of feed to maintain their body conditions, feeding the same amount every day is absolutely fine. However, once you start to move up through the ranks and your horse's energy requirements change, um, it may be worthwhile um, adjusting energy intake depending on what work you perform during the day. That being said, we recommend that the horses receive their vitamin and mineral basis of their diet consistently across, across the week. So this is a situation where you might want to feed a vitamin mineral balancer consistently and then adjust energy intake for workload. So you can see here, this particular graph um, was a horse doing various workloads throughout the week, competing on Saturday with a day off on Sunday. So reduced feed on its day off, increased feed on its day of competition. Again, divided into multiple feeds per day to ensure that you don't overdo the size of the meal. Leading up to a competition, there's a few little tricks you can put in place to um, ensure your horse is at peak performance ready for the competition. One of the main factors, assuming you've got a lovely balanced diet leading up to the competition is antioxidant supplementation to reduce oxidative stress. So when horses work, their muscles um, obviously need to have um, support those free radicals. Um, and so we, would recommend feeding highly absorbable antioxidants, as I mentioned before, natural source vitamin E, um, nano E, or coenzyme Q10, which is a recently researched um, powerful antioxidant that, that we've been looking at. This is for the five days out before competition to ensure that levels are boosted. We also recommend um, some amino acid or protein prior to a, a bout of exercise. We do know that muscles will, will um, have most of their repair done during the time of exercise or immediately after exercise. So one of the more recent recommendations that we've been um, advising people on is to feed a very small meal before exercise um, with a concentrated form of protein or amino acids um, in the diet um, just before competition. So I'm talking about a couple of handfuls of lucerne chaff and you know, under half a kilo of a concentrated feed balancer or protein supplement so that the horse has got those amino acids sitting there waiting to be um, used to help 
um, repair their muscles. Um, we also recommend maximizing glycogen storage. Now, horses are not like humans. You cannot carbo load a horse. You can't um, also provide a horse with a big shot of a sugary drink prior to um, performing an exercise beat and expect them to have stamina. They just they'll basically crash. That doesn't work for horses. So what we recommend is ensuring that the horse is fed correctly um, leading up to a competition in the weeks prior so that they're getting enough um, energy going through their system. Um, and we certainly don't recommend feeding a carbohydrate-rich meal within four hours of competition. The time of feeding is really important and certainly important for horses that might be on the lazy side. That is because um, if a grain meal is given within three to four hours of, of an exercise bout, insulin will um, rise with the increase in blood sugar. Um, insulin will then start clearing that blood sugar and the horse will then be worked with a um, cardiovascular system that's basically got a lot of glucose pumped around and a lot of insulin. So that insulin's looking to store that glycogen, the horse is trying to burn it because it's trying to work and essentially will have a bit of a crash because there won't be enough um, energy in the tank. So we always recommend um, a good four hour window between the last feed of a concentrate or a grain um, before the horse works to allow the blood glucose and insulin to clear, allow maximum glycogen storage before the horse works. That being said, as you well know, a horse with an empty stomach is not a happy horse. So we do recommend um, forage availability during that four hours before the exercise bout, because keeping fibre in the gut is really important for gut health. Um, it provides a mat on the stomach to prevent acid splash. and also um, provides um, some volatile fatty acids when it's fermented in the hind gut for energy. The other factor to consider on the morning of an event is electrolyte supplementation. Make sure that the feed that you give them that four hours before is, um, has got some electrolytes in it or provide a buffered electrolyte paste, which helps protect the stomach, having, having a buffer in it. Um, don't feed electrolytes on an empty stomach. We know that electrolyte supplementation is really important for recovery and rehydration after an exercise bout. So feed electrolytes beforehand. You can see here that this particular work was done at KR where we fed a... Um, a preloaded electrolyte paste before a horse went into competition and monitored their water intake in the 24 hours after competition. And you can see here that the horses that were given that electrolyte paste had doubled the amount of water intake after 24 hours. So very, very important for recovery, especially after, say, the cross-country phase of a three-day event. You need them to be recovered overnight for the show jumping phase. After you've um, had an exercise bout or at the end of competition, it's important to rehydrate the horse, as we said before. So electrolytes pre-competition are important. And then offering water and roughage, so hay and chaff or, or a sloppy fibrous mash, um, as soon as respiratory um, rates have returned to normal, is really important. And then once the horse has had a drink, it's had some hay, you can then um, supplement it with supplements and offer some feed. Um, there's many ways to help these horses um, rehydrate if they're not feeling like they need to um, want to drink. Um, raising fresh grass, flavoured water with all sorts of flavours, molasses, apple cider vinegar. Um, we have a product called Drink Up that you put into the water that um, is incredibly encouraging fussy drinkers to drink. Um, I'm getting bombed by the cat here. Do you want to just open the door and let the cat in? Sorry about that. Um, and also feeding um, your feed with extra water, turning it into a mash, feeding a recovery mash is a great way of hydrating the horse. These um, tricks can also work for encouraging the horse to eat as well if it becomes fussy at competition. After a big exercise bout, um, the horse also needs to recover um, and, and build up its glycogen stores again. So there's quite a small window of opportunity for this to happen after the horse has, um, say, performed on a cross-country course. So there's quite a narrow window. Um, ideally, we need to be feeding um, a recovery feed within a couple of hours of exercise. Um, it's also important to remember if you're feeding a high fat and high fiber diet, this is slower to replenish glycogen. So we would recommend that post-competition, the horse's feed had some level of high carbohydrate grains or molasses in the feed. But again, you need to make sure the horse is used to receiving that grain because you don't want to cause an upset gut um, by um, insulting it with the new feed stuff. Um, it's also known that supplementation with electrolytes 
after exercise is really beneficial for glycogen repletion. So don't skimp on the salt and the electrolytes um, with your post-recovery feed. If horses have a low appetite during competition or after competition, um, the administration of a vitamin B paste can also be quite helpful for boosting appetite. Obviously, we do want the muscles to repair after they've gone through a hard exercise bout um, because with um, certainly with a long cross-country phase or, or a big three-day event, we're going to have um, some muscle tissue damage and oxidative stress. So again, we recommended um, increased antioxidant supplementation leading up to an event and also in the days following to allow the horse to, re to recover. So again, natural source vitamin E, coenzyme Q10 are great supplements there. So this is sort of assuming your horse has got lots of energy, but I know that there's a lot of performance horses out there that will run out of fuel. They have a lack of energy at the competition, or they might just have a lack of energy all round. It's really, really hard to get them sparked up. Um, in a lot of cases, this is not related to nutrition or what you feed them. Um, it's more likely linked to genetics. So a lot of these horses are good doers. They've got a slow metabolism, which means that they actually burn their energy quite slowly. And so as a result, um, they are, um, he might not need to go enough, <laughs> sorry. Um, sadly, I, I can't offer you a magic feed or ingredient that will give this over, your overweight or your um, easy keeping or lazy horses more sparkle stamina, but it's important to rule out any health issues that might be considering, um, sorry, um, contributing to their lack of spark. Um, the common answer is really get them fitter. And I've worked with a lot of horses that are being um, exercised at incredibly high levels and they're still running out of spark at events, so I know that it's tricky. Um, lethargy generally can't be fixed by adding a scoop of, of oats, um, but if we get them even fitter, they will work, they will build up their muscle and burn more calories. Um, things like hill work is incredible at building fitness. Um, Interval training are other um, tactics to take into account for these lazy horses. Um, and with these horses, um, the timing of feeding is really vital. So take into account that four hour window where you've got to have, um, don't feed them high amounts of grain within that four hour window because you've given them optimum chance to clear the, the blood sugar and store that gly um, glucose as glycogen. So timing of feeding for these, these lazy horses or these horses that run out of steam. But obviously, a nutrition evaluation and a health examination to see that there's nothing else going on that's causing them to, to run out of energy is, is a good idea. So take home message from this talk. With the venting horses, as with all performance horses, energy is the most important factor. Calories fuel in the tank when you're designing your diet. Um, we can estimate energy requirements pretty precisely using the hours worked, and the distance work, you don't need a heart rate monitor, although it helps um, to see what level your horse is working at. We would recommend feeding a combination of energy sources from carbohydrates, fats, and fiber. Um, and we then re also recommend to ba balance out vitamins and minerals, including electrolytes um, and antioxidants. We also um, recommend feeding your horse strategically leading up to a competition and on the days of competition to maximize performance and ensure that the horse is recovered so that it can compete the next day if it's in the middle of a competition or it can recover for its work that it's being asked to do in the future. As we said during the talk, every horse is an individual. We need to feed them as an individual. Every horse will need a tailored diet analysis because what works for one won't necessarily work for another. So I do invite you to contact us for um, diet analysis and we can help get your haze and forages tested. We can look at what's the best energy source for your type of horse um, and help you there. So please get in touch. And also, if you'd like to sign up for our newsletter, that would be fabulous too. We've got a lot of information in there about feeding um, horses. So at that note, I would like to call on the panel of experts to um, help me answer the questions that I'm sure have flown in while we were, while we were on here. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. So we do, we've actually got quite a few questions. Um, so the first one that we had come through was from Claire. Um, and she asked what types, types of feeds and regimes are useful for fussy horses to ensure they maintain their energy. 
um, intake and minimise weight loss during competition and following competition when they go off their feet. What types of feeds are suitable for the horses? Well, obviously, um, delicious flavours, of course, are going to help a horse want to consume their diet. But I do understand about fussy eaters when they go into a strange environment. So I would be looking at different flavourings to encourage um, eating. So as we mentioned before, a bit of molasses water, um, apple cider vinegar, apple sauce um, can help um, improve the palatability of feeds. But it is really tricky to get, get feed into them. We did talk about um, vitamin B paste may help with um, improving appetite. But yeah, it's tricky with those fussy horses, but if you can keep the um, digestive tract healthy with an awful lot of fibre going through them, you're definitely halfway there. Um, I don't know if Dr. Peter Huntington, who I can see has come on board, might want to add anything, or David Nash? Um, I guess, Rissy, the only thing I would say is um, make sure the horse is familiar with the feed. Don't just introduce something new at the competition. And maybe think about uh, managing, you know, gut health with sort of ulcer control beforehand, uh, perhaps a course of resolve for a few days before, uh, before travel. And when you go to the competition, might be useful there if the horse is not on full time or look at some other antacid type um, uh, aids to gastric and hind gut health. Great advice. Yeah. Uh, we've got a question that's come through here asking about what does evidence tell us about the use of high fat diets in horses that tie up? Is it safe to feed carbohydrate and protein feeds to performance horses that don't have a history of tying up? Yes, well, high fat diets are recommended for horses that tie up. We've done an awful lot of work looking at fat as an energy substrate for these horses and have worked with the leading expert in um, rhabdomyolysis, um, Dr. Stephen Galberg, and have, have designed several diets around the world looking, um, using fat and fiber as energy sources for performance horses that tie up. So yes, fat and fiber is a really good way of feeding horses that tie up. Horses that don't tie up utilize carbohydrates really well. And so I would highly recommend a diet based on carbohydrate as an energy source for horses that don't tie up and um, protein. Make sure the protein intake is, is suitable for muscle repair and recovery, but I would be relying on it as an, as an energy source because it's not so proficient. Perfect. Um, we've got a question from Gillian asking, how long does glycogen replenishment take in horses? I've heard that it's longer than people. Is that true? Pete? Um, yeah, it can, take a, it can take a few days. Horses don't replenish glycogen uh, quickly, and uh, you can't glycogen load them like you do in people. So it uh, it takes uh, takes some time. Uh, so you're not going to get it replenished from you know cross country to show jumping day. So it's it's taking several days. It's a two to three, two to five percent per hour. So it does take a long time. Um, we've actually got a really interesting question here, which David, you might be best to answer probably up your alley um, from Aiden. Uh, so in the cattle industry, the use of water dispersed supplementation is quite popular. Um, do we know of any systems like this in the equine industry? Um, and if not, why do you think that is? Is there any limiting factors? Yep, sure. I've, I've seen that a lot in the north, north of Australia and uh, medications in poultry and pig industries. I think the main thing we need to look at is how we can control the rate of intake. So horses intake of water is highly variable. Um, when we're looking at what they're dosing within these products, they're only minerals. So if, if we get the, the combination right, the minerals are water soluble. So you have to have a specific type of mineral and we get the intake right. Yes, we may be able to get the right amount of uh, minerals in but we're forgetting about our vitamins as well and we need to look at the total diet when it comes to this so we need to make sure we're getting our forage our proteins and our carbohydrates in there but as just as a purely mineral supplementation i haven't heard of it um, being in practice in the equine industry but there are a lot of aspects that i think wouldn't wouldn't be able to be done on a scale just for one or two horses Perfect. 
Um, one, one consideration there is if you can train the horse to drink ele- water with electrolytes in it, they will drink more water full stop. So. Um, perfect. So I've actually got a question here um, about off the track horses. So we, we kind of delved into this a little bit last week. Um, so the question asks, what would you do to recommend as the best approach for feeding a recently retired racehorse um, for letdown and then getting them to return to work to begin their new eventing career um, and any common things that we tend to notice in these off the track horses. Um, sort of continuing on from what we briefly chatted about last week, obviously horses coming off the track, they do still have quite a high metabolic rate um, due to their fitness and their digestive efficiency is relatively low. So that makes it difficult for them to, in some instances, put on condition. Um, Additionally, you've got individual uh, considerations there as well. Um, Probably the biggest thing that we do see a little bit is a bit of appetence. Um, You know, a lot of these horses will come off a a grain-based ration, uh, which is fine, but avoiding neophobia or the introduction of new unfamiliar things like pallets um, might be something just to consider uh, in there as well. Sudden removal of these sorts of grains and these high energy feeds that they've come from uh, usually does result in, in weight loss. So we have that balance. We also need to think that perhaps their microbial um, health in their hind gut, so the fermentation vat that is responsible for breaking down all of that fibre and forage that Clarissa has has spoken about as being so important, is uh, less efficient. So we do need to consider that. Mental health, um, gastric ulcers, general gut health, all of those sorts of things certainly need to be considered as well. And the way we then take them from maybe an intensive, stable environment uh, where they've got all all the time to eat their feed um, by themselves and putting them into a group paddock where they might be challenged for that feed uh, can be a little bit intimidating for, for some horses. So making sure that we do give them an option uh, of, of eating that feed away from the rest of the herd, if that's the situation they've now found themselves in. Um, same considerations for water. So making sure that they are actually drinking the water source of their new um, environment. So if they are used to you know, small, stable waters or something similar or buckets, they may be less inclined to seek out some of the water sources, dams and natural water sources, or once again, competition from other horses in that environment. Um, And some certainly off the track horses may have reduced uh, pasture intake. So they may pick at pasture less um, because they have been kept in a stable. So providing them alternative forage sources like hay could be a good way to... um, you know, get them through that little transition phase whilst they adapt their, to their new life. Um, and obviously keeping all of your normal things in there as well, you know, rugs and, and don't just turn them out uh, suddenly into, into an environment that they're not used to. Um, we also have a question up here from Sarah asking, which you've kind of spoken about, but she has a really good doer. Um, and how do you feed for energy because she gets lazy during the competition, but we really don't want to cause any weight gain. So maybe touch on that again. We've had a few questions of that. About that. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that is, again, the tricky one, which is why it had its own slide. It's really tricky for these horses that are good doers that tend to be genetically lazier type horses. Um, there's not a magic feed that you can feed to give them more spark or um but and certainly um, get them fitter is the is the answer, which is probably not the answer that you want to hear because you probably the horse is probably incredibly fit. But there is a means to get them fitter. There's no point in giving a high calorie feed or a big scoop of oats before the competition because um, it's not it's not going to work and it's probably more likely to cause them to. So again, it's all about about fitness and getting the horse to boost its metabolism so that it's burning energy more rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got a question here specifically about um, how coconut meal might fit into nutrition. Um, are there any particularly useful um, times that you would recommend this um, into a horse's ration? Are we, we're talking copra? Possibly. Okay. I'm not sure. Just coconut meal, they've said. So, okay. yeah. Um, sure. um, yeah. 
I'm going to leave that to the Australian nutritionists. <laughs> Kate? <laughs> Well, pass, pass the parcel there. Um, okay, so uh, coconut meal is, uh, depending on the um, origin, is a, not a bad source of fat. It's low in starch, um, but is often loaded up with aflatoxins, uh, mycotoxins. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be feeding it uh, unless uh, you are sort of feeding it with a mycotoxin binder or if it was incorporated into a prepared feed where uh, the quality was uh, quality control uh, was uh, was in place in terms of uh, in terms of that I mean it, it has some theoretical benefits uh, but uh, it's sort of powdery and I think it's got you know more disadvantages compared to other things that you can use to feed perfect um have anything you wanted to add to that one? No? Okay. Um, we've actually got a question here. Um, is it helpful to add bicarb to the feed at cross country day? Um, I'm assuming that's relating to lactic acid buildup. <laughs> but do you want to answer that question? I mean, no, it's not beneficial. <laughs> um, that swab, oh, it would contravene the rules of FEI. Correct. Yeah, and it's it's you know depending depending on how much you feed, it's unlikely to do anything. But um, yeah, it's it's not useful if you're giving large amounts of it. Um, we've actually got a product question here. So, uh, is the Nano Q10 product suitable to be used in amino acid um, before competition, or what would you recommend? And how could Nano Q10 be used? Eight. Uh, well, Nano Q10 would need to be fed every day as an antioxidant. So it's not like uh, the nano E where you can start a few days before a competition and build the vitamin E levels up. It takes a bit of time, a couple of weeks probably for uh, tissue levels of coenzyme Q10 to increase. Um, it's got special value in horses prone to tying up or, or muscle damage after competition, which is a lot of, uh, a lot of eventers fit into that category. Um, and uh, horses with high GGT. So they're the, uh, they're the, um, sort of would be two things that uh, high GGT in a blood test. There'd be sort of two indicators for feeding it. Um, the third would be potentially uh, just aiding aerobic um, energy production. Okay. And thor thoroughbreds are thought to perhaps have lower levels than some other, some other breeds of horse. Yeah. Cool. Um, we've actually got a really good question here. Um, so, any recommendations uh, for what to be aware of when feeding a horse that has had uh, laminitis in the past? Um, currently feeding hay, fibre, vitamins and beet pulp. Do you go on to three-star on this type of diet um, or do you have experience creating um, a diet for a horse at this level with a history of laminitis? That the laminitis was traumatic laminitis, not metabolic laminitis. Um, feeding a lower carbohydrate diet, high fat and fiber, provided she's able to maintain her body condition um, at the workload you're asking, of course they can go at that level. Um, it's probably going to be horse specific, but yeah, there's, there are performance horses that have um, suffered laminitic episodes before and provided they've come through the other side. Um, they can be managed at, at that level. Um, Dr. Huntington, who is our veterinarian on staff, may like to add to that based on traumatic and performance. Well, I just think it's so dependent upon what the cause of the laminitis episode was, and there's many causes, and it's a whole you know, seminar in itself. So I think uh, it's hard to give very general advice, advice but it's certainly yeah. possible. You know, the horses, horses have had laminitis related to travel, travel sick, um, travel. They've had it related to lots of lots of yeah, things, yeah. and you know there's PPID or insulin dysregulation uh, to be aware of. So uh, you know there's a few 
a few factors and how you approach it will be different in different circumstances. But maybe contact us directly if you want to your horse. Yeah. Um, what is the optimal way to increase glycogen for competition? So you kind of touched a little bit, but can we write any additional advice? The optimal way is, is obviously feeding them the right amount of energy or the right amount of digestible energy in their feeds leading up to a competition. Um, making sure that you have got some carbohydrate on board if your horse can tolerate that. Um, not feeding within four hours of an exercise bout to allow optimal glycogen storage um, and making sure the horse has got electrolytes in its feed because electrolytes are vital for replenishment of glycogen. Key points there. Yeah. Um, yeah there's still a lot of questions. We might, um, we might, there's just one other question that we might cover off, um, which is once again, covered it but it's quite um complex so you know the better the horse or the fitter the horse gets for the, for uh Desiree the more difficult he becomes to control so how can he be fed in such a way that he's still manageable and doesn't get too hot so he's obviously doing massage and endurance by the sounds of it so how do I find the best slow release energy for him well, the best slow release energy are your fats and your fibres, which I'm sure you're probably utilising if you're um, performing at um, endurance. Sometimes these hot horses can, can be hot and need to burn what they've got floating around in their bloodstream before they calm down. But a lot of it does come down to exposure and training and getting them used to the, to the environment. But yep, certainly your diet can be very much focused on fat and fibre. Um, that's all very good slow release energy. Um, and certainly fibre sources such as beet pulp um, have got really high levels of digestible fibre. Um, so, again, you can get a lot of energy into them um, and not a huge mouthful. So I'd say keep going with high fat and fibre. Try and um, get as lower levels of, um, of carbohydrate or, or um, sorry, starch and sugar as, as if that's what might be affecting his behaviour. Um, and then see how you go. But we might need to talk again, talk to you individually as well to see what you're doing and see if we can pull some tricks out of the bag. Yeah, I think that's really smart. Um, and just one very last question before we introduce our topic for next Wednesday night, um, because it's a good one and certainly one we get lots of questions for on the 1-800 number um, and through email, is if you've got horses with a faster metabolism um, and others in your team that have a slower metabolism, what's the easiest way to organise your ration um, to make sure all requirements are met but still have um, enough energy to meet the horse's metabolic uh, rate? Right. So this is a really great um, opportunity to talk about balances and vitamin mineral supplements. So if you've got a team of horses... Um, from little ponies to big, fast eventing horses, you can feed a balancer most of the time across the board to all the horses, depending on specific needs, but mostly they can feed a known amount of balancer, which doesn't have a high level of calories, and then you can adjust the energy intake depending on that horse's metabolism. So if you've got an easy keeper, just a balancer pallet and fibre is probably fine. If you've got a horse that needs to have a huge amount of feed to maintain its body weight and energy levels, then the balancer pallet plus the addition of an energy source um, to keep that horse going is a great idea. So balancer plus beet pulp, grains, oils on top of that to, to um, meet their energy requirements. So certainly people who've got multiple horses, a balancer pallet or a vitamin mineral supplement like a gold pallet, fabulous for providing all the horses with what they need vitamin and mineral wise and then you can adjust the energy intake depending on the horse that's the best way of doing it perfect well we might leave the questions there only because there's still quite a few to go but anybody that didn't get questions answered we will get in contact with you um, and help you through that way um, so lastly this evening, I've put the link to the next webinar in the chat box there. So please register 
for that. It's going to be a great opportunity um, next Wednesday. Uh, now we're just changing the time a little bit. So we're actually going to run it next Wednesday, the 3rd of March. Uh, for those of you in Australia, it will be at 11.30 a.m. So just before lunch and on Melbourne time um, and 7.30 in the evening Eastern Standard Time. Is that right? In the U.S.? Maybe. <laughs> um, so we're actually going to have a number of elite eventers across both Northern and Southern Hemispheres. Um, we're going to run a little bit of a professional eventers panel where we're going to discuss some of the training and fitness uh, programs that they use to actually keep their teams looking and feeling and performing at their best. So um, if you've got any questions that you would like covered off on that evening um, by, by our team of experts that will be joining us, uh, please send an email to advice at kr.com. Um, that's probably if you can do that sooner rather than later so that we can collate the questions and get them organised for the panel. That would be lovely, but there will be an opportunity on the night to ask perhaps a few questions as well. So um, with that, we will leave it there um, and please feel free to register for next week's, the last part of this eventing fitness nutrition webinar. Thanks, guys.